<coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, urology is one of the subspeciality of surgery, and this is the last, uh, you can say, system which we are studying in surgery. And uh, in this one, there are like just five words, four or five important lectures which will cover all the neurology. Like we will study about uh, um, prostate cancer, which is the most common cancer in males. We will, of course, we will, we will, we, we will st have a lecture on bladder cancer also, but I'm talking about the important one. And uh, testicular cancer also come in this one, but uh, not so important anyhow we will cover that uh, we will cover there, there will be lecture on trauma uh, there will be lecture about stones again a topic which you already covered in internal medicine but of course we will talk about that also in pediatric surgery there is testicular torsion uh, we will talk about uh, um, what you can say some other lectures which will be um, about uh, a very you can say important topic related to surgery that is uh, uh, obstruction of urinary tract in which like we are going to cover um, benign prostatic hyperplasia very 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 important right and of course gen genital urinary infections okay and infections of course you have covered UTIs right in medicine so uh, for that like there will be a small lecture about the tuberculosis and that's it Th these are the few topics we have to cover in this and if you will take any surgery book uh, what you will found found what you will found is basically uh, there are just few lectures or just few pages of urology written in, uh, like uh, which you must know or I'm basically a medical student must know about these things. So let's start, begin. Uh, I will talk a little, very little about anatomy. Uh, you already know anatomy, you have covered anatomy. So what I'm going to talk about is like just an overview of anatomy. We all know the anatomic structures, we know what is kidneys, we know what is ureters, we know what is bladder, we know what is prostate, of course prostate is in males. And then there are of course like in males, not in females, but in males there is testes, there is vas deferens and of course the urethra. So the urethra is long in males and urethra is short in females and that's one of the reason that the males have uh, less UTIs and females have more UTIs and uh, one of the very important thing to know about these structures they they lie outside the peritoneum but uh, you know in neurological surgeries uh, what they do is like the approach to these structures uh, you can say through the peritoneum so that's why you can say the approaches are intraperitoneal approaches to the kidney to the bladder so that thing and nowadays the story is a bit changed because uh, nowadays you can say uh, laparoscopic surgeries are available so as we know kidneys there are two in number they are retroperitoneal and they are covered with the fascia we call it as I don't know, it's Gerota or Gerota, whatever. And uh, <coughs> uh, the left one kidney is very closely placed to the spleen. And uh, on the right side, of course, there is liver. And that's why you can say the right kidney is lower than the left kidney. Okay, I'll let You can see in this... Uh, picture as well that the right kidney is a little lower than the left kidney because of the liver so uh, uh, that's one of the thing um, we know the blood supply to the kidneys right 
the, they are from the renal arteries which arises from the aorta and uh, uh, what you can say um, this is like important and uh, in medicine maybe you have studied you know renal artery stenosis and the renal veins they drain into the vena cava inferior vena cava and uh, yes like this is the thing and of course the ureters they arise from the kidney and above the kidneys we know that there are adrenal glands and uh, we know what is the function of the adrenal glands uh, epinephrine or epinephrine uh, glucocorticoids mineralocorticoids okay all these you know they are formed by adrenal glands so <clears throat> uh, these are the ureters which they are showing and uh, uh, like uh, these basically drain the urine to the bladder and uh, uh, the important thing is um, you know that there could be stones which can block ureteric colic we have we may have right and then of course this is the bladder and in males of course they are placed very close to the prostate and uh, uh, like of course you have covered the bladder and that in quite detail what are the muscles it is called as detrusor and uh, the prostate you know it is present at the neck of the bladder uh, when we will study prostate, we are going to talk more about the anatomy of the prostate and uh, yes, uh, so and in the males of course there is scrotum and the testes and we know like what is the function of that and uh, what is the anatomy of that. So, uh, uh, to start with uh, in this lecture, we are going to talk about renal trauma, urethral trauma, bladder trauma, uh, urethral trauma, and urethral trauma, and testis trauma, of course. Uh, like, and of course, like this is the time, this is the thing in which what you can say um, surgery is needed, right? In case of trauma, uh, we go for surgeries, like if needed. Otherwise, of course, like some of the trauma uh, basically heal up without. Uh, any uh, surgical need so uh, before starting what you can say uh, this urology uh, if you will revise a little you know from your medicine you have done a uh, urology in medicine you know what are the common signs and symptoms you know what is hematuria when the blood started coming in the urine uh, renal problem can present as renal pain Pain can be in colic in nature, like ureteric colic. Uh, there could be retention of urine. There could be urethral pain. Okay, so uh, of course, like uh, because you guys all covered those things, so I'm not going to into detail of that. And we must know what is anuria, anuria when there is absence of urine. So basically, there are two terms. One is called as anuria, and one is called as oliguria. So oliguria is like when uh, someone is making less than 400 milliliter of urine okay some books say 300 some books say 400 so I remember like 400 that's it so uh, and urea is like complete absence of urine when the person is not passing any urine right uh, so like all the things of course you know so uh, that's why I'm not going to into detail of that okay so I will start with trauma uh, so as you can see in the introduction that the urinary tract is divided into two. One is called as like the upper and the lower urinary tract and external genitalia. Same like you know how we divide the uh, you can say uh, respiratory system right uh, into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Uh, so uh, same thing goes here as well. 
So you can say upper urinary tract is renal, uh, like the kidneys and the ureters, and the lower is the bladder and urethra. And of course, then there is ge external genitalia. So uh, it's a very easy topic. Uh, you can see over here. Um, now, urinary trauma is very common. It can occur in multiple situations. For example, in deceleration injuries, in blunt traumas, um, sometimes, you know, when someone uh, saddle injuries, things like this. So, it is often non life threatening injuries, okay? And, by, and its presentation is subtle. Subtle means like uh, not like not very pronounced clinical features or symptoms. Uh, okay. So, you can see approximately 10 to 20 percent of all injured patients have some kind of urinary involvement, of course, like so, which can lead to some morbidity like impotence in males and incontinence of urine, for example. So, it is very important to completely understand the injury and treat that, of course. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is renal trauma or the trauma to the kidneys. Okay. So, the most common form of renal trauma is basically by falls or uh, by blows. Okay. So, uh, for example, uh, someone who is involved in a crushing injury to the abdomen, for example, you know, they may they may have this thing or road traffic accidents. Uh, so you can see like it's the most commonly injured organ in all the urinary system. And of course, if it is the most common one, so uh, I'm not saying it is a very important topic, but, but what I'm saying is, uh, what I'm going to say is like uh, in all this trauma things which we are going to discuss now, of course, this hold a very important place because this is the most commonly injured organ and uh, whenever it is injured of course it is associated with other uh, organ damage as well of course intra-abdominal organ I'm talking about so uh, the cause of injury could be like it could be blunt trauma it could be penetrating trauma penetrating trauma like you know gunshots or stab wounds or anything like this okay so uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, this is a very important point, surgical point of view, that most renal traumas are managed conservatively. So uh, basically, we don't need any kind of intervention or surgical intervention to treat that. Uh, so what happens, like anyone uh, who have uh, um, kidney trauma, uh, basically, they can present with some features like uh, um, hematuria, blood can come, okay? And of course, like... Uh, uh, it is a very important sign, you can say, or symptom, whatever. So, blunt trauma, which is the most common form of renal trauma, it can occur in motor vehicle accidents, falls from height, assaults, and of course, like whenever there is high velocity in fact, a impact, it can result into a contusion, a hematoma, a laceration. And in deceleration injuries, there could be renal artery thrombosis or a, a renal vascular disruption or Evulsion. Evulsion means like completely cut off. And the other type is, of course, penetrating. Uh, it is less common. Uh, uncommon is, by the way, uh, I think like this thing will give a better idea. So again, as I was talking about, like it could be a gunshot wound, it could be a stab wound. Uh, and of course, like the mechanism of injury is like, of course, uh, through the renal parenchyma or through the renal tissue like there is a complete uh, division or uh, uh, cut can be there right uh, so uh, if you go further when to suspect a renal trauma uh, again like the same point which I'm talking about I was talking about before is like uh, anyone uh, simply uh, who get a renal trauma uh, of course first of all we take history and in history of course in emergency what we do is like uh, we check the scenario the scene uh, like uh, what kind of uh, event was there like either it was a road traffic accident either the person fall down 
or rather it's a stab wound so things like this right so you can say any deceleration injury stab or other low velocity penetration in upper abdomen uh, lower rib fractures gunshot anywhere in the trunk or polytrauma so uh, now the the patient can present with hematuria okay or uh, the patient can also present with abdominal distension after renal injury um, we call it as me <laughs> meteorism okay so uh, okay hematuria like it's not like this that hematuria will occur all the time but it could be a closed hematoma like just in the abdomen okay so uh, what happens is of course we uh, we can go for a ct scan nowadays of course that's a very important thing so we can uh, classify or um, uh, keep the renal trauma in certain categories grade one is when there is contusion or contained subcapsular hematoma you can see over here without laceration so contusion will lead to hematuria and urological studies will be normal whereas hematoma could be subcapsular it is non-expanding and parenchyma is normal right so this is the features of grade one then grade two is like non-expanding perinephric hematoma plus minus cortical laceration you can see this laceration less than one centimeter and there is no urine extravasation so uh, uh, now see hematoma is perirenal it is non-expanding and laceration is less than one centimeter and there is no urine coming out like of course like if this uh, cut will go up till here so of course the urine will start leaking into the um, abdominal cavity right so of course like uh, that thing is going to uh, cause more problem um, then there is grade 3 and it is cortical laceration more than one centimeter you can see but without any extravasation see the cut is until here but it did not extend to this place so uh, that's why the urine is still you can say uh, is not leaking out okay uh, so this is grade 3 and these are the features laceration is more than one centimeter but uh, still uh, you can say uh, it is not leaked out right the collecting system is intact uh, then there is grade 4 of course in this one basically you can see like there is extravasation with the cortical laceration or thrombosis of segmental vessel the laceration is going all the way through renal cortex medulla into the collecting system right uh, and the vascular means like main renal artery or vein injury with contained hemorrhages there so this is like grade 4 uh, uh, grade 4 trauma so uh, other than that uh, you can see over here uh, what is grade 5 uh, as you can see over here grade 5 is uh, a completely shattered kidney and uh, you can see over here that uh, lot of lacerations are there which are extending inside the cortical system like some of them maybe but see this piece of the kidney is broken or and you can see the renal particle is evolution is there or thrombosis is there so this is like grade 5 or simply uh, remember like in grade 4 and grade 5 there is extravasation of urine right whereas in grade 3 2 and 1 there is no extravasation of urine so what is the difference between grade 4 and grade 5 is like grade 5 there is the kidney is shattered completely okay uh, this is a very important point to remember like how we classify so see this is American Association for Surgery of Trauma AST classification so anyhow uh, of course when there is urine is leaking in the outside the kidney inside the abdomen so of course like that is uh, that will give rise to more trouble so how we diagnose of course we check for the symptoms and signs as I told you before hematuria and all these things or abdominal pain and then we investigate and then we deal with the complications so investigations are very easy nowadays because we have 
fast scan, we have CT scan, so that thing can be done very quickly. And we can see easily either like what's the condition of the kidney. So the symptom, as I told you, could be uh, flank pain, hematuria, abdominal dissension, nausea, vomiting, abdominal swelling, uh, which I told you it is called as uh, meteorism, right? And uh, signs could be, of course, due to the blood is, the patient is losing the blood, so the patient can go into shock, flank mass or fractured ribs can, you can find. So in that case, of course, we go for uh, investigations. Uh, you can see over here, here uh, hematuria is often indicative but not specific to organ, may be absent in serious renal vascular injury due to blunt trauma and doesn't correlate well with trauma severity. So trauma severity, of course, uh, which we'll just know when we, uh, we will go for further investigation like CT scan. So investigations, of course, you can go for a urine examination, you can go for a blood examination, you can go, go for imaging studies like CT scan, uh, IVU, if you know what intravenous urography, what is that? Abdominal ultrasound can be done or plain X-ray chest and abdomen can be done. But the best investigation is of course CT scan because it provides the detailed condition of this, uh, of the extent of the injury. Um, you can grade the renal injury. Without this, of course, you cannot grade. So, CT findings, if there is any urinary uh, extravasation, if there is any hematoma, medial to the kidney, it means like, of course, lateral can occur in even grade one, but medial, it means like there is pedicle injury. And uh, if there is no, like when we give the contrast to the patient and we do CT scan F and if the contrast is not reaching the kidney, it means, of course, the arterial blood supply is cut off. Like if you will go logically, very easy to understand. Okay. Here is the CT scan of a renal injury. You can see over here, over here, right? And uh, uh, what happens is like whenever there is any uh, injury to the kidney, there could be complications and what kind of complications can be there? There are some early complications like hemorrhage and shock or urinoma like collection of urine is called as urinoma and there could be some late complications like infection, loss of renal function or hypertension. So again, hematuria, we know like person is losing blood, hem like hematoma, it means again the person loses blood because now the blood is not in the, into the intravascular space. So for that, of course, what they do, they use a cystoscope or a catheter. Uh, for urinoma, of course, they have to evacuate that. Okay, uh, hypertension, of course, it's a late complication, but it can occur because renal parenchyma is injured. Sometimes there is post-traumatic aneurysm formation of the renal artery as well. So these are the complications. So management, of course, you will go for the emergency management, like you will treat the shock. Remember about ABC, uh, airway breathing circulation, you will treat the shock, you will resuscitate the patient, you will evaluate the other injuries and then we go for like managing the kidney. So active observation is needed because most of the cases of blunt renal trauma uh, and 50% of the penetrating trauma basically needs conservative management. Uh, and correction of general conditions with active surveillance bed dress until gross or mature clears and keep on doing hematocrates and imagings. So what they do like, of course, wherever patients reach to the emergency, they ask for the bloods to arrange bloods and uh, they provide pain relief. They keep on doing their vitals. Uh, they give antibiotics to prevent infections. Uh, they take the urine samples. They do intravenous urography, they do CT scan, and uh, all the things are done, and watchful waiting, or keep on observing. But 
if the condition is not controlled by that, of course, surgical exploration is needed, for, especially when there is life-threatening hemorrhage or large expanding hematoma. So, surgical exploration is needed like in these cases. Okay. So, of course, when they surgically explore that area, so what they do like uh, the first aim is especially to control the bleeding and uh, uh, like uh, again on surgical exploration they decide what to do. So <clears throat> what they do is basically um, they check like of course what is the condition of the kidneys of course we cannot remove two kidneys but if for example one kidney is too much damaged so of course they are going to remove that they remove any hematoma because you know the hematoma can cause pressure on to the adjoining structures we call it as tamponade so uh, this thing is like what is done so but if for example you know if they found a small tear so maybe they will just suture it okay otherwise of course if a kidney is grossly damaged then the only possible thing or the only way out is doing nephrectomy or like in simple words removing the kidney sometimes you know what they do is like partial nephrectomy like they remove the very badly injured area and suture the rest of the kidney so this is what they do so exploration is done in that case and this is how they deal it so these are the indications for absolute indication for surgical exploration if someone have persistent renal bleeding with hemodynamic instability, expanding perirenal hematoma, pulsatile perirenal hematoma. And these are the relative one. Penetrating injuries, extensive urine extravasation, grade 5 injury, shattered kidney or non-viable tissue or arterial injury. So again, these are the principles of surgical approach as I was talking about. In the start, I talk about, you know, like most of the approaches are transabdominal, midline laparotomy. There could be flank approach. And the main aim is to control the bleeding. And then they expose the kidney, they open the fascia, they decide either they have to repair the kidney or remove the kidney. And uh, of course, like deprive, like cut off any non viable tissue, suture them. Sometimes they use gel foam or surgery cell to seal that area. They, if there is any extra position of urine, so they must repair the collecting system as well. Okay, and if there is any parallel camel defect, so cover that. So what they do, how they cover, basically they use a piece of peritoneum. You can see over here, the badly damaged kidney, they remove that, and then they suture the kidney, and then they, they are covering it with peritoneum. So this is how renal trauma is. They deal. Then comes urethral trauma, and in urethral trauma, you can see over here some same some major points that uh, external trauma is very rare but uh, uh, and very less chances you know like they get damaged you can see over here but usually iat iatrogenic is like when you are for example they are conducting some surgery so during that if they, they damage your ureter so in many of the gynecological, vascular, urological surgeries, you know, the ureters can get damaged. So, like especially while doing ureteroscopy, ureters can get damaged, can get ruptured, things like this. So they can happen. So anyhow, there is a grading system for ureter as well. You can see over here, grade one is contusion or hematoma. Grade two is laceration. When there is less than 50% of transaction. Grade three is laceration when there is more than 50% of transaction. Grade uh, 4 is complete transaction with less than 2 cm tissue loss and grade 4 is complete transaction with more than 2 cm tissue loss. Now the important thing I, I must mention over here, you don't have to remember the grading. You don't have to remember the grading and these kind of things. You don't know the general exams like PLAB or things like this. They don't, they don't ask questions like this. Okay. Uh, so what are the features uh, uh, simply whenever anyone have uh, uh, ureteral damage 
um, how uh, how they can recognize that or how how they know that uh, uh, like there is some damage to the uh, what you can say ureters so first of all they there could be no symptoms right uh, again like the same thing you will ask about like how the injury happened and of course like if it is iatrogenic so during the surgery the surgeons can look for example if the ureters are damaged or not so uh, depending on like either it's external trauma either it's during the surgery or of course like if it is during the surgery so it, they can present with low grade fever flank pain or fluid drainage from incision or drain sites so there could be no symptoms to fever pain uh, or sometimes a urinary fistula can form through the abdominal wall or through the vaginal wall so these kind of things so of course the diagnosis can be done on based on the symptoms and signs symptoms like fever flank pain abdominal distension nausea vomiting and urea if for example someone have both of the ureters are injured by by we call it as bilateral injuries there and signs is like the patient can present with acute peritonitis there could be urinoma again a collection of urine is called as urinoma there could be sepsis so uh, of course like based on that they investigate that you can do a urine examination maybe you will find microscopic hematuria uh, and sorry there's spelling mistake and uh, you can go for intravenous urography and uh, uh, ultrasound CT scan or you can go for a retrograde urethrography like which they give contrast through the urethra or anti-grade pyelography can be done so complications can be there could be a stricture formation hydronephrosis collection of you know water or urine in the collecting system so that is called as hydronephrosis urinoma abscess urethrocutaneous or urethrovaginal fistula as i was talking before and loss of kidney function these are the complications so how to manage this thing so surgical exploration with debridement and anastomosis is done so lower third injuries can be uh, treated by reimplantation with or without swas hitch or bladder flap called as buhari flap middle third injuries what they do is Uretro, uretro uretrostomy like they connect one uretro with the other one and upper third again the same way so basically uh, uh, what happened is uh, if it's a simple cut you know during surgery what they do they do end-to-end -end anastomosis that's it and uh, uh, sometimes they put a stent also okay but uh, when you can say when the damage or the cut is in the lower one third of the ureters then they go for this buary surgery um, depend on that you know what they do like they take a, a bladder wall and they uh, make it like a tube and they connect it with the lower urethra so this is the thing okay um, so one of the thing you know is like when whenever there is loss of tissue like uh, maybe due to trauma or due to surgery when they lose a piece of ureter the good thing is like they can mobilize the kidneys towards a little downward as well okay what they do like they bring the kidneys a little down so this is the thing which can be done and uh, uh, this is how they, they they repair that okay other than that uh, uh, after this ureter injury uh, there is bladder trauma and uh, bladder trauma is a little you can say a little technical not 
too technical but you can say just a little technical or different from the other traumas which we have covered now bladder trauma is not so common as you can see but whenever it is damaged you know it is associated with multi-organ injury okay sometimes the bladder basically uh, an injury or rupture you know it can be disconnected from the urethra as well and most of the time bladder get injured when the bladder when the person get the injury when the bladder is full like maybe a direct blow and sometimes the bladder can be, be damaged while doing surgeries as well like for, in females of course gynecological surgeries or in males also so any kind of surgery of course you know damage to the adjoining structures is a very common complication of surgery any surgery i'm talking about 70 to 97 percent of ruptured bladder from blunt trauma is associated with fracture of pelvis so of course in that case you have to take care of that as well and 30 percent of fracture pelvis are associated with ruptured bladder 25 percent of intraperitoneal rupture of bladder is associated with fracture of pelvis so you don't have to remember these figures because like this is just to give you an idea okay the bladder rupture especially you know the most common type of bladder rupture is extra peritoneal most of the time it is extra peritoneal if you know the anatomy of the bladder you 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 will know like what i'm talking about so you can see like the bladder trauma could be due to contusion or it could be due to laceration or rupture Contusion is the most common one and laceration is the less common one. Now laceration could be extra peritoneal or intraperitoneal. As I told you, extra peritoneal is the common one. Intraperitoneal is less common one. Intraperitoneal basically ruptures uh, usually they occur uh, as a result of blow when there is distended bladder. Okay. Uh, whereas intraperitoneal, of course, uh, uh, extra peritoneal most often often you can say it is caused by blunt trauma okay or uh, while during surgeries it can get damage so extra peritoneal which is a common one blunt traumas or surgical damage intra peritoneal direct blows okay so uh, now again you know guys this one is the grading um, i'm showing you over here i don't want to read it but you can say grade one two three four five same thing and again, it is according to the laceration. And one important thing to notice in this one is see, um, all the extra peritoneal are less grade, but whenever it is intra peritoneal, it is basically grade C for five, right? So uh, again, the same point I will repeat extra peritoneal are the common one, intra peritoneal are rare one. So, how we can know that the person have bladder damage of course it could be hematuria abdominal tenderness suprapubic bruises or urine is leaking but it's not always like this that you can see it in 82 percent so there could be hematuria, no hematuria at all so uh, but intraperitoneal ruptures you know they give more pain okay intraperitoneal ruptures give more pain sudden pain the pain can be so intense that the patient can go into shock due to pain. So simply whenever there is blood, bladder injury, uh, we can go for investigations. We can do CT scan. We can do ultrasonography. CT scan is the best investigation. You know, in, when all the surgical patients, CTs hel is helping a lot. We can go, go for retrograde cystography we can go for CT cystography. So, uh, we can go for X-ray even. We can go intravenous urography, I IVU, just to see the leak. So, retrograde cystography is basically to confirm the diagnosis. Okay? And, uh, whenever like, of, of course you will go for, see this one is retro cystography photograph, see. Uh, intraperitoneal rupture and you can see the urine is in the abdomen or you can see over here this is the extra peritoneal rupture see urine is collected over here in the peri vesicular space 
this is the intraperitoneal one and this is the extraperitoneal one and this is a CT cystography you can see the urine leaking right so anyhow whatever is there what are the complications of intraperitoneal versus extraperitoneal in intraperitoneal ruptures there will be urinary frequency shock peritonitis azotemia in the extraperitoneal there could be shock or pelvic abscess so how they manage again uh, these are the general principles which we apply to all the trauma patients we go for abc we resuscitate we provide antibiotics to uh, uh, like uh, as a preventive measure you know so that the patient should not develop any um, infection if there is contusion there is no specific therapy required but whenever there is extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal rupture you know we go for management so bladder can be approached by midline laparotomy incision okay and uh, uh, what they do is like uh, they try to repair it so if there is extra peritoneal rupture you know conservative therapy can be given in which they put a catheter drainage for 7 to 14 days and they keep on doing cystogram just to see either the repair is just done or not but if it is not uh, solving the problem then we go for surgical repair okay so like of course like uh, in surgical repair they are going to suture that area simply and in intraperitoneal rupture again surgical repair is needed laparotomy by laparotomy uh, approach midline uh, incision and uh, they close the injury with bladder drainage is done this is how they deal it okay after that uh, the last one which we are going to uh, not the last one the last one by the way is the important one because is urethral trauma you okay urethral trauma is very common in males okay uh, remember why because the males have large urethra and the females have small urethra so uh, that's why uh, there is increased chances that you know in cases of uh, um, trauma or falls you know um, urethral damage is very common in males or saddle injuries straddle injuries for example uh, in surgical books you know they have given what you can say a typical photograph of a person walking and he step on a manhole and the manhole basically twisted and uh, hit on the external genitalia in that case of course what happens like the urethra can get damaged this thing or for example you know bicycle injuries especially uh, what happens is like in uh, bicycle injuries um, sometimes you know you can hit the hit the rod so uh, as we know like you know that the, the urethra in males it is going all the way through the up to the glands penis and it is, it is very long one so in males of course there are many urethral problems as well for example strictures can form uh, things like this so uh, uh, to talk about urethral trauma again they are talking about the um, injury uh, sorry anatomy so it is the posterior urethra it is the anterior urethra and uh, you can see like the prostate the one which is passing from the prostate and in the membranous part of the uh, muscles you know this is called as posterior urethra and the one which is running all the way uh, through the penis is like anterior urethra so you can see like the division through this line this is the posterior urethra and this is the anterior urethra Okay, so what happens like uh, uh, posterior urethral injuries are basically uh, are associated with fracture of the pelvis and uh, anterior urethral injuries can be due to catheterization, instrumentation, blunt trauma like falling, like straddle injuries or penetrating trauma like stabs or gunshot. Oh, by the way, very rare, okay, but like of course we have to discuss each and every scenario. Cycling accidents, remember, or manhole accidents, as I told you, like you know, uh, they are also common. One. 
Okay, so what happens whenever there is any urethral injuries, if you will see over here, here they are talking about the posterior urethral injuries. Cross hematuria, 98% inability to avoid. Inability to avoid or simply it means like inability to urinate or retention of urine. There could be blood at urethral meatus and this is a very important sign. Remember whenever you see blood on the urethral meatus, don't catheterize them if you are not trained. Of course, like or simply I specialists will come and they, they must catheterize that patient. You may find a, a pelvic or suprapubic tenderness or hematoma and one of the things which you can find on rectal examination is a high riding prostate. So whenever there is high riding prostate, remember that, you know, it means like the urethra is divided, like is uh, um, transected. And that's why there is no connection between the anterior and the posterior urethra. And that's why the prostate is high riding, riding up, not at the normal place. So any person who have urinary retention or peri perineal swelling or blood at the urethral meatus, uh, take it as urethral trauma. Whereas you can say in anterior urethral injury, they are more common. They are as a result of direct trauma. And you will find again blood at meatus, unable to maturate, and penile scrotal or perineal contusion hematoma or fluid collection. So simply, uh, whenever any patient comes like this way, we take history, we ask like what was the event, how this thing happened and uh, we do examination, we check the urethra, we check the urethral meatus, we check the, we can do a DRE or digital rectal examination, we check the prostate and on history we found like urinary retention or pain and all these things, right? So. Based on that, you know, we decide. Okay. The main thing which can be used as a diagnostic tool, tool is called as retrograde urethrogram. So they put a dye and they take an image. And you can see over here this film. Uh, like the dye is going over here and we can see the spill. Okay. Or for example, you can see the spill over here. So retrograde urethrogram is the most important diagnostic tool in this one. What are the complications of this one? Urine extraposition, infection or abscess formation, and structural formation. Okay. These are the things which can occur, complications which can occur. And strictures are very common. Okay. Though it is written here at the end, uh, but uh, they, of course, like they don't develop right away but they take some time to develop so but strictures are very important in this regard how we manage if it's a partial tear catheterize them if you while catheterization if you uh, encounter any resistance remember never proceed okay stop there because you can basically change a partial tear to a complete tear and of course, when there is complete tear, then, you know, surgical repair with urethral alignment is needed. So, that's one of the reason I told you that, you know, if you are doing a urethral catheterization. Uh, by the way, if you are founding uh, blood at urethral meatus, never try to uh, catheterize if you are not uh, trained or experienced. Rather, leave it to the specialist or a urologist but uh, the main thing is like you know first of all they always go for a, a retrograde urethrogram or nowadays there are cystoscopes are also available but uh, uh, then they use the smallest caliber urethral catheter and they place it place it right but when the urethral tear is complete then of course like they have to do surgical repair and in surgical repair, of course, they are going to excise that area and they are going to do end-to-end -end anastomosis. And after that, you know, they place a catheter so that, you know, there should be no structure formation. And after, after, of course, you know, after that, when the 
healing is complete they are going to uh, what you can say uh, remove that catheter okay so this is about um, urethral trauma and uh, just few points testicular tear trauma about testicular trauma so testicular trauma are mostly due to blunt traumas like as a result of fights and uh, what you can say hits yeah like cricket or even like football or hockey of course like it can occur in any type of sports but uh, uh, cricket is one of the very common uh, what you can say uh, game in which you know the ball can hit especially the testes and they can get damaged so very rarely you know it is like gunshot wounds or stab wounds of course so the patient they present with pain hematoma and bruising and uh, uh, physical examination is often very uh, difficult to perform by because there is too much pain so the most helpful thing in this regard is basically ultrasonography uh, so that we can see what is the condition okay in these patients so again like this is the grading i don't want to go through all this grading okay not important at all but how they manage so most cases are low grade injuries contusion and hematomas and therefore non-operatively just by giving analgesics to relieve the pain and bed rest you know they can go but whenever there is rupture to the tunica albuginea or expanding or large hematocele is there or intratesticular hematoma is there of course they go for surgery and during surgery they decide either they can repair or they cannot repair of course if they can repair they align it they repair it if they cannot remove uh, repair they do orchidectomy so orchidectomy is like removal of testes so this is the thing they do so this thing but the important thing in this one like of course whenever there is some uh, bleeding is there of course like you know try to surgically explore that thing as soon as possible because you know if you will delay the surgery maybe uh, you are going to leave a viable tissue and maybe the tissue will become non-viable and then of course you have to remove that thing so this is the important point to remember so thank you so much guys for this for listening i hope you understand and i will see you next week